My name is Andy Signor. I'm a digital creator with numerous awards and over a billion views, thanks to many popular creations I made, including Screen Junkies, Honest Trailers, Man at Arms, and more. On October 6th, 2017, one day after Ashley Judd's New York Times article started the Me Too movement, I was literally the second person to be publicly accused of sexual misconduct. Allegations claimed that I had privately made some sexual and flirtatious comments towards female fans online, and one fan made harsher claims and falsely accused me of multiple sexual assaults, abuse, and retribution. Without any factual evidence or efforts to seek the truth, headlines were written and stories were inflated and or fabricated. Often reporting falsely that I had been demanding or expecting sexual favors from my employees and that an array of women were claiming I had assaulted or abused them. None of that was true. I filed a lawsuit. I made a statement denying the false claims of assault, abuse, and retribution. I publicly apologized to my family, my friends, and fans for my poor discretions and marital infidelity. However, during this time, I'd been legally barred from addressing the specifics about any of those allegations and from sharing factual evidence to challenge and disprove the egregious claims against me. Until now. Before I do that, it's important that I reemphasize I'm sorry. The truth is, I did awkwardly flirt with and make inappropriate comments to some of my fans, despite being married. In doing this, I betrayed so many people that I love and respect. I put them into horribly awkward and uncomfortable positions, and I'm truly sorry for this behavior. When I look back, I realize I was sometimes a real jerk. I was selfish, I was arrogant, I was angry, and I was way too full of myself. I completely lost focus of what was truly important around me. I'm not proud of this behavior, and I never want to be like that again. I've changed a lot, but to be honest, I'm still angry. I'm angry that someone could tell such horrible lies about me, and everyone, including those who I thought were close to me, just blindly believed them. These egregious claims labeling me a sexual predator, workplace harasser, and a rapist are categorically untrue. And I do not want my family hounded forever by such malicious slander. I promised to explain when I could, and that time has come. So what really happened? Here are the facts. I had a completely consensual relationship for two months with April O'Donnell, AKA April Dawn. She knew I was married and we both knew exactly what we were doing. And when our relationship ended, April and I amicably chose to go our separate ways. Then very much to my shock, more than a year later, directly in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein bonfire, April launched false and outrageous allegations, rallying a huge social media mob against me. Her lies were relentless, without a shred of evidence, and they created national and international headlines, scorching my name. In this video, with the approval of my counsel and the support of my family, I will be sharing Google-verified texts, emails, tweet exchanges, and photos before and after each of our three hotel get-togethers. They document the truth about our affair, including April's false and defamatory statements. On October 6th, 2017, April O'Donnell tweeted the following, which should be noted, she also recently deleted, but it's been archived on many sites and news sources. And it originally stated this, Andy Signor tried to sexually assault me on multiple occasions. I trusted the company to do something considering two other women also came forward with me. They only had Andy's interests in mind. He threatened my boyfriend's job security, saying he would fire him if I told anyone. He took out sex toys and tried to force them in me, took pictures of me without my permission, and promised a position at Screen Junkies for sexual favors. I hope this encourages more women to come forward, because I believe you. April. Later that day, as many questioned her online, April posted a second, more detailed statement, which she has kept online. The first time, he used Chicago Comic Con by saying they were having a Screen Junkies party and I was invited. The party ended up being him, alone in his hotel room, trying to force himself on me. This is the first easy lie to prove. I did meet April in August 2015 at a convention in Chicago. She volunteered to participate in a live show we were shooting there, but ended up performing poorly due to her lack of knowledge about Martin Scorsese. I could tell it was just her nerves, but the audience was very disapproving. I felt bad for her, and I apologized to her after the show. We talked a lot, and I thought she was funny, and I didn't know anyone in Chicago. So we ended up exchanging numbers, which prompted some mutually flirtatious texts, including her offering to be a discreet, weird groupie for me. I invited her to my hotel room to watch a movie, which she was completely up for. There was no tricking her into a party. She knew we were discreetly chatting. I flat out asked her, wanna just hang out in my room and watch a movie or something? She agreed. Then later asked, am I just bringing my sparkling personality? I responded, whatever you want. I'm not sure what we're going to do. Cute, nerdy girl coming up to my hotel room. I have never done that, which was true. 
She showed up to my room, and we talked and played a movie card game. And while she was sitting on the bed, she batted her eyes at me several times, but I was too nervous to make a move. Our texts from the next morning show no hint of attempted assault. Instead, they show the opposite. First, she admits to having a lot of fun, and later I admit my regret for not making a move. This was a sentiment that we both shared again later that day as we continued to text flirtatiously. Later that evening, she attempted to meet up with me again, but our schedules wouldn't allow it. We texted our goodbyes and agreed to hopefully see each other again. We ended up doing that rather quickly. After Chicago, I flew back home to Los Angeles, and about a week later, I texted her again, and I asked her if she had any regrets not making a move. As you can see from our texts, she did. This is when our mutually flirtatious exchange became much more sexual in nature. April says I took photos of her without her permission. This is false. In fact, our emails clearly show that April was the one who sent various nude photos to me. I have blurred them here in an effort to take the high road. But I assure you, they are not just scantily clad photos. They are sexually explicit. And she very clearly sent them to me herself. They are also clearly of her. This is also confirmed over texts. These photos are real and they provide graphic evidence that April has not been telling the truth. As we continued to chat, the show she taped in Chicago aired on YouTube, but the comments upset her. I felt bad again, so I offered her a seat on our fan cam if she was ever in Los Angeles, which was a free opportunity that we offered all of our fans. April wanted to see me, and she was very much into the idea of being on the show again. We were communicating daily and talked about her visiting me again in Los Angeles. She then told me that her boss was a big fan and he would be more lenient about time off from work and going to California if she had the opportunity to be on the show. I told her no problem, so we figured out a date and she quickly booked her own ticket. None of this was mentioned in any of April's statements. Instead, her lies and false allegations continued, saying that she was later invited by Screen Junkies to come out to LA to be on the fan cam. She says I stopped by her hotel uninvited and took a sex toy out of my bag and tried to use it on her. She then says I threatened to kick her out of the hotel if she told anyone, and that I later used her relationship with her boyfriend against her, saying if she told anyone, I would have him fired. Our texts clearly reveal we planned the visit. As a matter of fact, we had been constantly talking about hooking up while she visited, and she very clearly invited me to her hotel room. I did not show up to her hotel room uninvited. And for the record, a sex toy was never part of any of our encounters. Our immediate texting after my visit discussed how pleased we were about being together and her wishing that I'd come back for round two. A theme she continues when she asked me to see her again the next day. When I tell her I couldn't make it over due to work effing me, she responds, I'm supposed to be the one effing you. Someone sexually assaulted would not express herself that way to any alleged abuser. We met a second time, and during that meeting, she showed me that a former friend of mine slid into her direct messages, asking if she wanted to hang out in Hollywood later that night. Knowing his reputation, I suspected he also was trying to hook up with her, which later she admitted did happen. I took no offense, and I genuinely thought they'd get along. I told her, he's a good guy. I said, you guys could hit it off, and they apparently did. After our visit, April planned to meet me again at New York Comic Con that October. Weeks passed, and then she shared that her relationship with my friend had become more serious, and she didn't want to continue our affair. I expressed via emails that I wished them the best. We agreed to keep our relationship between us, and she began a new relationship with my friend. And in December of 2015, April was publicly tweeting me positively. I asked, would anyone be tweeting casually online like this with their alleged rapist? In January of 2016, after a month of silence on both of our parts, April sent me the following threatening email. I thought it was written by someone else because it was filled with lies about our relationship. In it, she stated that she was happy in her new relationship and that I needed to stop harassing her, stop calling her, stop sending her gifts. I wasn't doing any of those things. She said she was concerned with her safety, that I forced myself on her in Hollywood, and that I needed to leave her alone or she'd take actions further. I was flabbergasted. But since neither of us wanted our affairs to go public, I assured her I was fine with not talking again. Nonetheless, I was baffled by her email. Then, in August 2017, April's need to keep our consensual affair secret took an even more outlandish turn when she and my former friend privately reported a laundry list of false accusations to my employer, including false charges that I had been harassing them both for two years via emails, texts, and blocked phone numbers. In retrospect, I realize I should have taken her nonsensical threatening email more seriously. When I was presented with these charges, I was terrified that my wife would learn I'd been a cheat. I was also very worried about my job, so I hired an attorney 
who spoke to HR and demanded evidence of April's false charges, including any harassing correspondence over the past two years, which there was none. I shared information about our affair to HR, including private correspondence between April and I. There was ample factual evidence of the consensual nature of our affair. My lawyer told me afterwards the look on their faces said volumes. April's credibility was out the window. That's why nothing was done for two months. Despite what was said online, nothing was ever offered to substantiate April's allegations. And no other charges of sexual assault, abuse, or workplace sexual harassment were ever presented. No one created an alibi for me. I simply provided tangible evidence to prove my innocence. April began to escalate her coordinated story against me. She verbally defamed me whenever and wherever she could, even to my own colleagues. She began to look for anybody she could find who had ever been a fan of the show to look for more infidelities or exchanges that she could use against me. She was determined to have others join her in labeling me as a serial abusing rapist ready to assault the next woman in my path. On October 6th, one of those women she discovered, Emma Bowers, went on Twitter and falsely inflated a decade-old mutually awkward exchange we had by painting me as a sex-crazed boss demanding action from an intern. Emma was not an intern, nor did she work with me at Screen Junkies, something I feel she irresponsibly allowed many news outlets to incorrectly run with. I worked with Emma years before Screen Junkies and was immensely impressed with her work ethic. And our many emails prove that Emma was the costume designer. She became a friend and was a creative partner on a small project we made together with a few other friends, a zero-budget internet series made a decade ago, not an actual production company per se, long before my time at Screen Junkies. Because the show was my concept, I did stand above her on the creative chain of command. But she had a more senior role than she implied. I was both surprised and flattered one evening when she opted to share with me a link to her own nude pinup photos. I don't recall saying exactly what she accused me of, but I am confident that I responded with compliments. I was married, so we both regretted the shift in tone, and we mutually apologized. We continued to work together for months without any problems or incidents until she bailed the night before on an important shoot. I remain perplexed that Emma would inflate our incident, comparing me to the criminal and abusive acts of Harvey Weinstein. Her specific charge forever plastered my name next to Weinstein's and opened the door for April's more aggressive allegations. Emma even admitted to waiting for April to come forward first, just a week before she spoke out about me. April was claiming to be an ignored victim, saying her charges weren't being taken seriously, that they didn't stand up for women, and for days publicly demanded that if you or someone you know has been hurt by Andy, no matter how big or small, come forward. You won't be ignored any longer. April's flagrant request for help did prompt other fans to share stories and private messages showing that I was flirting with them online. A dozen women in total came forward. None of them suggested anything remotely resembling April's allegations. They were online flirtations gone awry, private messages which all read far worse in the context of April's malicious narrative. This fact is clearly shown in this Twitter exchange between two fans discussing me. His behavior is appalling, but if anything, the majority of these direct messages just proves he's a cheat, a bit of a creep, and has zero game. Agree with you in most of the direct messages I've read, but he was unacceptably inappropriate in April's account. Indefensible. Changes context of direct messages. It's true. My behavior was appalling and inappropriate. However, April's allegations of assault clearly changed the way every interaction was read, indicating malicious intent. Even some of the accusers admitted this. Never said I was harassed, just sharing my interactions with him. Like I said at the time, I thought it was all innocent. Two years ago, I just ignored his shit. But in the light of everything, any one of us could have been April. This is so effed up. I never once claimed Andy harassed me. I never said I was a victim. In sharing those emails, my intention was to strengthen April and Emma's allegations. These women came forward to support April, even admitting that their own experiences with me were not that big of a deal. This didn't stop regular people from crafting psychological profiles on me or news outlets irresponsibly summing it all up to make a far more incriminating read. That's the problem with Twitter mobs and social media justice. Malicious intent can be implied by one or two people who may not be telling the truth, but followers don't do diligent research and instead merely share the headline of the seemingly justifiable action. 
and given justifiably how triggered many were by the creation of the Me Too movement, my entire fan base, including my own colleagues, rallied together for a seemingly just cause, to stand with April and demand my termination. Over the past two years, I learned April and my former friend reveled in their assassination of me and my career, while regularly appearing on the channel I built and even accepting donations along the way. Still, I was hopeful that maybe, just maybe, one day she would retract her allegations. But she never did. I don't know the truth about what motivated April. However, I believe that she was using me for access to my brand. And I believe when I became unavailable due to being married, she moved on to my colleague. And I believe that she didn't want him to think that she was using him too. As she got a taste of Hollywood and their relationship got more serious, I think she was willing to do whatever she had to do to keep her house of cards from collapsing and protect her relationship, even if it meant taking me out. Her relentless assault on me, labeling me a serial rapist, will forever have an effect on my children, on my parents, on my ability to secure work and support my family. And I'm angry. I'm angry at her sickening choice to lie and play the victim in our affair. It grossly disrespects real victims of sexual assault. And that is why this video was important to me, to set the record straight. I'm not proud of many of the lousy decisions I have made, but I committed no crimes. I deserve to be able to continue to work and to support my family. I need to thank those of you who have supported me through this difficult period. I'll never forget it. You know who you are, and I'm beyond grateful for your help and your friendship. Most of all, I need to thank my amazing family, who I love more than words. I couldn't have gotten through this without you. For those of you who read the headlines and were afraid to reach out, I hope after hearing my story, you'll reconsider. I miss speaking to a lot of you, and it would be great to talk again. I'm sure many of you still have questions. I do too. I've learned a lot, but this isn't just about me. We live in a dangerously accusatory culture, and there are no guardrails. I plan to explore these topics, as well as my own honest failures in a new project that I'm working on. We all make mistakes. I think it's how we learn from them that actually defines us.